let's transition to elk disease, the second most common. And, um, you know, interestingly, this was initially described in lung adenocarcinoma in 2007. So we're less than 10 years into this. We, as we alluded to early on, we have a new standard, crizotinib, that's been compared in the first and second line to standard chemotherapy and is better. How do we make crizotinib better? Right. So I think one thing that we have to remember is that this is a tremendous story where you go from identification of ALK gene rearrangements in lung adenocarcinoma in 2007 to an approval for a drug in 2011. Phenomenal story. Um, what, what kind of gets skipped over along the way is that crizotinib happened to have a little bit of ALK activity, but mm -hmm. it was being developed as a MET inhibitor. Uh, and so people have to acknowledge that it wasn't the best ALK inhibitor out there. And um, so we've, we've seen um, crizotinib as an extraordinarily useful drug, and we've seen progression-free survivals on the order of what we see for any targeted therapy. So it's been great. But the way we move forward for ALK and what we've seen approved in the second line for patients with ALK-positive disease is simply better ALK inhibitors. It's not necessarily a spectrum of activity or, or targeting particular mutations. It's just better ALK inhibitors, and those have made uh, dramatic strides for us uh, in the second line. And Jared, uh, walk us through, we now have two a sec, uh, uh, true ALK inhibitors, the so-called second, maybe they're the first generation ALK inhibitors. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, but, but we have two. We have seritinib, uh, electinib. Give us your perspective on these two agents. Sure. So it's a lot the same as what we saw with the next line EGFR story. We have agents with very high response rates on the order of about two-thirds of patients meeting resist criteria for response. We have uh, nice, durable, uh, progression-free survivals. I think uh, what we don't know is how to sequence these agents. Um, we see that these two agents, as well as some of the later generation inhibitors being studied uh, in clinical trials for ALK, um, have somewhat different spectrums of activity against particular uh, resistance changes. And I think as we move forward, a more sophisticated uh, understanding of exactly uh, which resistance change is present might help us to drive a little bit better which agent might be best for a particular patient, particularly as we get a few more of these approved. So, so we, with these two agents, we really have no guidance yet in terms of which one should be first and which one should be second. The, the other perspective I'd like to get, uh, maybe I'll ask Tom about this, is that you know, one of the things about the ALK population, it has a propensity ALK disease does to involve the CNS. And we see many of these patients uh, uh, doing that. And these drugs have activity in the CNS. And so I think that's an advantage. Uh, you, your, your thoughts about that? I think, uh, I think on the second line trials, about 40% of the patients had brain mats. And so this is a huge portion of our patient population. And I think in some ways, and so, at least in some of my patients, that's become the life limiting disease. They just get these recurrent brain uh, metastases. And then in the worst case scenario, they get like, the meningeal disease. Mm -hmm. So I think the blood-brain pair penetration of both electinib and seritinib are uh, huge ad advantages at this uh, point. And I think um, you're going to see more of our trials really monitor the, the CNS right. recurrence and progression and response. Uh, and, and I think, you know, in several of my patients, it's allowed us to delay the use of whole brain radiotherapy. Remember, the ALK population is, you know, the median age is early 50s. These are young people, uh, often gainfully employed and productive and not wild about getting whole brain. So if you can extend that time period to when they need whole brain, we use taking a well-tolerated yeah. pill. Um, Ben, let me ask your thoughts about toxicity profiles between the two agents. Very different. Yeah. Uh, and that perhaps may drive treatment decisions for our patients. Um, as somebody who's used both of these, these agents, uh, seritinib has a, a higher rate of nausea and vomiting and certainly uh, diarrhea. Uh, LFT abnormalities are also there. Um, and uh, electinib, we just don't see those signals as high a frequency as we do with seritinib. And in my experience, um, uh, and, and, and patients have told me this who have been on seritinib and then gone on to receive electinib, um, is that the, the elect, electinib, even though it's more pills a day, uh, seems to be better tolerated. We're not seeing those rates of nausea and vomiting, uh, certainly not the diarrhea, uh, even though it's eight pills a day, I, I believe that's the dosing, four in the morning, four in the evening. Yeah. Um, this, this, this drug seems to be, has been a welcome change from, from at least the seritinib story thus far. Yeah, and if I remember correctly, and panel members, please correct me if I'm, I'm not remembering this correctly, but th there are very few drugs that I'm aware of that when you take them orally have the same plasma in CSF concentration. 
right? Yeah. yeah. And this is one of them that comes close to that. So I think that's a huge advantage for electinib in terms of the brain stuff. Not, I don't know the data on seritinib, but I'm just saying that uh, that's a huge advantage for all of these second generation. Um, tough question. Uh, sh we've talked a lot about T790M, mm -hmm. and that occurs in 50 to 60 percent. We say rebiopsy is the standard of care. You have an ALK patient presenting. We know that ALK resistance is a little murkier in terms of what to do. Um, secondary mutations or amplifications are in a minority of patients, not the 50 to 60 percent we see with that. Should, Greg, I'm going to ask, pick, pick on you, should we be rebiopsying ALK patients to look for these things, or what do you do with these? I certainly think we need to learn a lot more about Research, these uh, yeah, patients. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, understanding this from a research perspective is rational. I think we've learned the value of rebiopsy just in t terms of understanding patients' tumors, and um, we, we learn a lot from this. It's hard to say that this is a standard of care in any way, shape, or form to rebiopsy at this point. And partially what drives that is, you know, with the initial report on seritinib's efficacy, it was a phase one trial reported in the New England Journal of Medicine, there's a waterfall plot that specifically looks at patients whose mechanism of resistance was, was identified. Yeah. And there are a variety of mutations, there's amplifications, there's losses. It's all there, and they all responded about the same. It, and there's no mutations that, you know, they, they can't document an ALK alteration. Right. And, and yeah. they still respond. That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. Yeah. And I think, you know, there, while T790M is a clear dominant mechanism yeah. of res resistance for EGFR, there's no dominant mechanism in right. ALK. And so uh, it's a lot less clear as to whether that that biopsy is a clinically relevant one. Yeah, so t talk to us uh, in just kind of tying up this section. Um, uh, you know, we hear about drugs coming down the line, brigantinib, lorlatinib, and others that are coming around. How many of these drugs do we need? Right, I think that's a, that's a really fair question. You know, I think there, there are at least uh, another three drugs that are nearing FDA approval in this space. And I think a lot's going to depend on what we find is the right first-line drug. You know, I think we've seen uh, a recent press release that compared uh, uh, for a, tr a press release for a trial that compared electinib to crizotinib as a first-line treatment in Japan. Uh, so a very different patient population. But that suggested that the, there was a prolongation of progression-free survival. Again, we need to know how big that difference in progression-free survival is. So we need to figure out what the right first line uh, ALK inhibitor is, and then we're going to figure out the second line. And uh, the real paucity of data for us now is how does a patient who's progressed on seritinib do with electinib? How does a patient who's progressed on electinib do with seritinib? Where does brigatinib work in all these? We really need to understand this. Now, it's, but it, this is a patient population of four or five percent of our patients with lung adenocarcinoma. So there's not an infinite number of trials that we can do. And of course, there's not a lot of incentive to compare various sequences uh, by the, the sponsors of these uh, drugs. So I think the NCI had hoped to look at this. I'm not sure where that, that project stands right now, uh, but it's an important question that we're going to have to understand clinically the results.